2 Corinthians 5.17. This is a passage that every born-again believer, certainly every evangelical and fundamentalist Christian is familiar with this verse. They usually use it to clobber others over the head. But I want to try to clarify what the Word of God is trying to tell us today by the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. 2 Corinthians 5.17 reads like this from the King James text. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, A New Creature Indeed. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. Master, one more time, God, we come before you. The word of the Lord is by far the most powerful, wonderful tool that the church has. Lord, you've given us your word that our faith might be encouraged, that we might grow and prosper in our walk with you. Lord, that as we hear the word of God preached, positive, constructive changes are made in our spirit that help us to live a better life, not so that we might earn heaven, but so that our journey here might be brighter, lighter, that our testimony might be greater, stronger, more effective, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I ask God that you would loose today the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Touch the messenger of God. Help me to do the work that you've called me to do. Oh, Lord, let me effectively, in love, communicate to the people of God what you would have me to communicate. That they might be blessed, encouraged, inspired, uplifted. Thereby. Send forth your word even now, God, to heal, to save, to deliver. As it goes forth, let those who are bound be set free. Let those who are unsaved, those who have not yet turned to you, let them find a place of repentance. Even as the word of God goes forth, let those like myself, Lord, who are dealing with sickness and infirmity let us receive oh God that healing that we so desperately need pour out the balm of Gilead we ask all this today in none other than Jesus precious precious name amen praise God and amen there are few passages from the word of God which have really been more twisted and contorted in an effort to rain down guilt and condemnation on believers than this passage. Preachers get some kind of an idea in their mind of what godliness and acceptable Christian conduct looks like. Theologians, preachers, believers, and denominations love to take this passage as though it stands all alone and they interpret it according to their theological prejudices and leanings but as with all of God's word we must always interpret the part in the context of the whole Amen. Did you hear what the preacher just said? Folks, don't ever read a passage, any passage anywhere in the Word of God 
do not ever read it and think for a moment that it stands alone. You have got to envision in your spirit where in the puzzle it fits so that the entire picture comes together so that the message God is trying to convey to you can be seen and seen clearly. More Christians have what I call fragmented theology than Christians that have consistent theology. No. I grew up in the Pentecostal church. I know what I'm talking about. On one hand, the message is love. The message is grace. The message is acceptance. The message is mercy. On the other hand, the message is judgment. The message is condemnation. The message is criticism. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, my goodness, how in the world is it that we can take pieces and parts of the same book and create so many different pictures? Well, it's easy because people do not do as the Apostle Paul admonished us to do. He said to Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman, a workman. Honey, when it comes to study in this book, it's work. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Oh, I'm going to tell you. There are certain denominations, there are certain sects, S-E-C-T-S, within Christianity, within the Christian world, that literally just believe that every line and every verse somehow or another stands alone and that they can effectively preach a message from that verse and they don't understand that no, 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 you always have to look at the part in terms of how it lays in the whole hallelujah when we look at this passage today we're told that a person who has been born again, the Bible way, is a new creature or simply a new creation. All things die and everything becomes new. Now I grew up being told, coming from a Pentecostal holiness background, I grew up being told, bless God, when you come to Jesus, hallelujah, and you're converted, everything changes. All the sin in your life drops out. Everything that displeases God should be gone overnight. And you it, and everything doesn't change the minute you pray through at the altar, then you haven't really been saved. That's all well and good, but I got news for you. That does not mesh with the message of the whole. <laughs> that interpretation does not even begin to comply with the message of the whole of God's Word. It's easy to pull this out of context. It's easy to apply your own definition of a new creature. I used today in my illustration for my message uh, a pegasus. And I did this because a pegasus is a fictitious creature. It is a winged horse. It is uh, not something that exists in the biological world, but it's something that exists in our imagination. I got news for you. The creature that a lot of Christians think you're supposed to become when you pray through and you convert and you become a child of God and you're baptized in the name of the Lord and you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The new creature, the new creation that you become, my friend, uh, is not a pegasus. Now I've 
said this before, and it's so funny. I, I love to talk to people who come from a fundamentalist or an evangelical uh, theological place. And they love, you know, uh, an LGBT person, for instance, cannot be a child of God. If you're a child of God, you're a new creature. Former things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Well, how do you interpret all? I mean, all things become new. Really? Oh. Well, let's see. You're a brunette today, so before you came to the Lord, you must have been a blonde. Your eyes are brown today, so before you came to the Lord, they must have been blue. Your skin is white. Before you came to Jesus, you must have been black. You're tall today, but before you came to the Lord, you must have been short. You got big feet. Before you came to the Lord, you must have little tiny feet. Well, that's ridiculous. <coughs> no, it's not. It says all things are become new. Well, but that's not what he means by all. Really? And what does he mean by all? What does he mean by former things that have died, that have passed away? You see, it is our theological leanings that inform how we read and how we interpret this passage. But it is not our theological leanings which ought to inform how we understand this passage. Listen to me. It is rightly dividing the Word of God that should inform how we interpret this passage. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 32, the Apostle Paul writes, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, other non-Jews, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Listen to verse 22. That ye put off concerning the former conversation. The word conversation here literally means behavior or conduct, okay? Doesn't mean a, a verbalization between two people. That ye put off concerning the former conversation, the former conduct or behavior, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed, now listen, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, 
that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, listen to this now, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Boy, I'm going to tell you, I know more Christians that let garbage out of their mouth that has absolutely no connection in the world with grace. When you stand there and say, God hates queers, and God hates these people, and God hates those people, got news for you, honey. There is no grace whatsoever in that statement, and according to the Word of God, that is corrupt communication. Verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind to another, one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Isn't it interesting? In 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul tells us that if a person is in Christ, they are a new creation. All things have died and all things become new. Then in Ephesians 4, he tells us Specifically, he tells us that we are to put off our former conduct and our former behavior, which he calls the old man, all, all uh, former things are passed away. Put off the old man. He said, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. What does that mean? That means the old man operates on the premise of what feels good. You see, as unbelievers, we do and say things according to what feels good. We follow our own desires. We follow our own lusts. The word lust most of the time in Scripture is not even remotely associated with sexual conduct. But rather the word lust, as you read it in the King James, oftentimes simply means our own desires, our own will. He said, put off the old man. The old man is deceived by deceitful lusts. It is the desires of the flesh. It is the will of the flesh that will lead you in the wrong direction. It will encourage you to say hurtful, hateful, mean, malicious things. It will cause you to do things seeking revenge and seeking vengeance. He said, but put off the old man. And then listen. He said, and be renewed. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And here the Apostle Paul says now in Ephesians, and be renewed, listen, in the spirit of your mind. I often wonder, Tommy and I, sometimes we'll talk, I wonder who the first person was that had the brilliant idea to take an ugly old horrendous monstrous looking thing like a lobster and throw it in a hot pot of water and then crack the shell and start eating it. I wonder who on earth that first person could have been that thought that might be a good idea. I wonder who the first person was that looked at a crawfish and thought, boy, I ought to throw a bunch of these in a pot of oil and water and then crack them open and eat what's inside. 
how, how did anybody even ever think to do this? How, how did anybody ever think, you know, or know that, that this was something that could even be done? I can't even imagine how it came about. Sometimes I look at culinary creations. And I'll think to myself, boy, the chef that came up with this dish was really creative. Boy, he really did something new. He really did something unusual. How did he do something unusual? How did he do something new? Well, he went somewhere. He did something that no other chef has ever done before. He combined ingredients that had never before been combined. And all of a sudden, when you combine these ingredients, you find that you have something very tasty and wonderful. Reminds me of the old TV commercial. You got one guy eating a chocolate bar and another fella, you know, eating out of a container of, of uh, peanut butter. And they bump into each other and the chocolate bar gets in the peanut butter. And the fellow pulls his chocolate bar out, but a piece of the chocolate remains in the peanut butter. And peanut butter remains on his chocolate bar. And they say, you've got chocolate on my peanut butter. And you've got peanut butter on my chocolate. And then each of them takes that chocolate peanut butter combination and they pop it in their mouth and they go, mmm, this is good. And boom! Peanut butter cups are invented. Peanut butter cups are born. All it took to create something new, listen to me, was combining ingredients that had never been combined before. Oh, my, 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 my. All it takes to create a whole new creation is putting things together that before now had never been put together. I wonder who the first person is who ever baked a donut and then said, I'm going to push some jam into the middle of that donut. I'm going to put some jelly. How about some strawberry jelly? In the middle of that donut. Let me see how that comes out. Let me see how that tastes. And they did it and they tried it and they said, Oh my word, this is delicious. What a wonderful creation I have made. And it is a new creation. Why? Because it did not exist before. And you brought things together which until then had never been put together. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Oh, I've got news for you today, children. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He is a new creation. That does not mean that all of a sudden we become a Pegasus. That does not mean that all of a sudden we become something supernatural. That does not mean that all of a sudden we no longer have to deal with sin. We no longer have to deal with weakness. We no longer have to deal with trials and struggles. That is not what this means. But something has been introduced to our life that hitherto, prior to this, had never been there. And once that ingredient, the Spirit of God, is introduced to the life of a believer, guess what? He is a new creation. You just put jelly in the donut. Hallelujah. You just created something new. Prior to conversion, prior to being born again, you are a human being walking about with a dead spirit inside of you. A dead soul, I should say, inside of you. The Word of God said that we were dead in trespasses and in sin. Isn't that what it said? Now, we were not physically dead, but we were spiritually dead. When we become born again, it is not our external that changes. It is not our external that 
that it becomes new? No. Like I said, my hair color is the same. My height is the same. My weight is the same. My eye color is the same. It's not the external man that changes, but something is introduced to us that then brings life into our spiritual man. And we become once again like Adam, a living soul. become a new creature. I'm not a human being walking around with a dead soul inside my body. I'm a human being walking around with a living soul inside my body. And what breathes life into that soul? The Spirit of God. So I have brought things together that until now have not ever been together. Thus, I have created a new creation. Do you understand what I'm telling you? And this then is why the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 4, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. He said, let your thinking be changed. Well, i got news for you. Your thinking, your thought processes, the way you look at things, the way you see things, um, that is not external. That is very much internal. Hallelujah. Oh, but I want to tell you, if you ever want to see the world in a very different way, if you ever want to be able to look around and everything you lay your eyes on, you suddenly see differently, have a change in your mind. Change the way you see things. Change the way you perceive things. But okay, a lot of people will tell you, if you've ever been close to death, if you've ever gone through an experience like I went through in 2000, where I spent two months in a hospital in one month on life support, and there I was in that hospital bed for two solid months, when I finally got out of the hospital, let me tell you something, the ride home was very different for me. The ride home was very strange. It was almost surreal because every single thing I looked at, I felt differently about. I looked at it differently. I saw it differently. I mean everything. Telephone poles looked different to me. Trees looked different to me. Cars looked different to me. People looked different to me. Had all those things changed? No. But something had changed in my mind. Just a little while ago, just a couple weeks ago, I was seconds away from death and God gave me a great miracle. All of a sudden, I have a brand new lease on life. All of a sudden, life is this gift. It is something new for me. And as I left that hospital, all of a sudden, every single thing I laid my eyes on, I looked at very differently and I saw it very differently. Got news for you, children. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He has a living spirit. If his spirit is alive, then that means that the mind, his the mind of his spirit, so to speak, is now new to us. And Paul said, and be renewed in the spirit of your Mind, He said, now what you need to do is let that new mind, hello now, of your regenerated soul, your spiritual mind, let that mind now begin to play a role in your life so that it affects how you see things and how you do things. Because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He's put off the old man. Former things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Has everything changed when you got saved? Did you go home and suddenly find you lived in a 30-room mansion with 14-car garage and 13 Maseratis? No! All things did not change. 
but they did. Talk to anybody who's really had a genuine born again experience. Especially people who have really been far away from God. People who've done some really rough things, some tough things, some they've been down some difficult roads. Man, they they didn't just kind of dabble in sin, they swam in it, you know. The man who beat his wife, the man who abused his children, the man who drank himself drunk every day and drank up his paycheck and his family went hungry because he was more interested in being drunk than he was buying groceries. All of a sudden that man comes to Jesus. He repents. He turns from unbelief to faith in God. He's baptized in the name of the Lord for the remission of sins. And God says, okay, now as far as I'm concerned, we're, we're starting on a clean slate. As far as I'm concerned, we're starting with a blank slate here. Then he receives the gift of the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, guess what happens? All of a sudden, everything he looks at is different to him. Everything. He doesn't see his kids the same way he did when he used to abuse them. He doesn't see his wife the same way he did when he used to beat her. He doesn't see the alcohol bottle the same way he did. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? People say, well, how come when so many people receive the Holy Ghost, how come uh, all of a sudden they never touch drugs again, they never touch alcohol again? You know, they're delivered from these bondages, they're delivered from these oppressions. How come? Oh, it's simple. Doesn't have anything new. God didn't tear it out of their hand. But they've been renewed in the spirit of their mind. And all of a sudden, they see things. And they don't see it the same. All of a sudden, you know what? I don't know. Oh, Jesus. They don't see the beer bottle. They don't see the wine bottle. They don't see the liquor as comfort or an escape. Oh, they look heavy and they say, you know what? All of a sudden, that looks like poison to me. All of a sudden, that looks like nothing but trouble to me. All of a sudden, that looks like the cause of marital issues. That looks like the cause of my abusing my children. That looks like the cause of my trouble with relationships. That looks like the cause of my dissension in my family. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I have an uncle a great uncle for many 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 years he was a, a very 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 severe alcoholic bad alcoholic had a number of car wrecks i don't know how many cars he totaled uh, married once had three uh, children and uh, he alienated his children he, he and his wife divorced he married a second time had another child with his second wife. She never thought a whole lot of him either. Wound up divorcing his second wife. Just, I mean, just had a life that was a constant train wreck. One day, he didn't come to the Lord, but we were praying for him that God would help deliver him from alcohol. And one day, a friend of his bet him I think it was a thousand dollars. Betting that he couldn't quit drinking, that he could go without a drink for I think it was six months or I think it was six months. And I'm gonna tell you, my uncle, he liked money. <laughs> that was that was approaching him the right way, because he liked money. A thousand dollars to him sounded like a good sum of money. He said, I'll take that bet. And he went off the bottle for six months. And after he had been off the bottle for six months, he said, Chuck, I could not believe how much clearer I saw things. I could not believe how much better I felt. I could not believe how much more in control of myself and in control of my life I felt. What happened? Did something change? 
on the outside? No, but something changed on the inside. You hear what I'm telling you? He had a change of perspective. All of a sudden, where there was cloudiness, there was clarity. All of a sudden, where there was confusion, he was focused. I want to tell you, when a child of God, when we come to the Lord and we're born again the Bible way, Two things are brought together that before this were never together. The Spirit of God and the Spirit of man. Hallelujah. And when you bring those things together, it's better than a peanut butter cup. And it's better than a jelly donut. Hallelujah. And when those things are brought together, all of a sudden, your perspective changes on everything. Ask anybody who has received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Ask anybody. People are so worried. You see, we live in an age where people are almost terrified to receive the Holy Ghost because there's so much false doctrine and false teaching out there about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You got Baptists telling you it's the devil. You got these over there telling you it's demons. You got these over there telling you people are just babbling and they're just, you know. And there's all this confusion and the enemy's done this on purpose in order to scare people away from from yielding themselves and surrendering themselves to the Spirit of God, which is necessary to receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But you know, Jesus said, if you ask your father for bread, he's not going to give you a stone. He said, if you ask your father for fish, he's not going to give you a serpent. He said, well, how much more is your heavenly Father going to give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him. If you ask God for the Holy Ghost, honey, you're going to get the Holy Ghost. You're not going to get something else. The devil is not going to slip you a Mickey. It doesn't work that way. You've got to trust God enough to know that if he's promised he'll give you the Holy Ghost if you ask him, that he's going to honor his word and give you the Holy Ghost. You see, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is as much an act of faith. Receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost is as much an act of faith as believing the gospel from the get-go. That's why in the Word of God we read, you know, Peter's preaching to the house of, of Cornelius and all of a sudden they all just received the Holy Ghost while Peter was still preaching. They were ready. They didn't have a head full of Baptist theology. They didn't have a head full of cultist theology. They didn't have all these negatives that had been preached at them for decades. So when Peter said, God wants you to yield and surrender yourself so that you might receive His Spirit. They're sitting there saying, Okay, Lord, if that's what you want me to do, then I'll do it. Boom! And they begin to speak with other tongues as their spirit man comes to life by the presence of the Spirit of God in their life. Ask anybody who's received the Holy Ghost. I'll tell you right now. I, I've been in this thing a long time. I remember the night, to this day, I remember the night, five years old. Brother Couts was the evangelist who was preaching at the little Pentecostal church I grew up in in southern New England. And I loved his, I, to this day, I remember a lot of the uh, anecdotes and stuff that he shared during his messages, you know. He told some wonderful stories of things that had happened to him and things he had seen and experienced. And to this day, I still remember many of those anecdotes and many of those stories. One night, he preached on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I was five years old. My mother says I was very precocious. When I was five, people thought I was 10 or 11 a lot of times because number one, I was big, and number two, I was ahead of myself uh, intellectually. And I'm not trying to say I was a rocket scientist. No, don't need much. Boy, that preacher loves to brag on himself. No, I didn't think I was a rocket scientist, but according to uh, my parents and my grandparents and whoever, uh, I was always very precocious and ahead of myself. 
Well, anyway, he's talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost and how we need to receive the Holy Ghost. And you just need to yield yourself and let God in. It's as simple as opening the door, saying, Yes, Lord, I'll let you in. Come on in, Jesus. So I went down to the altar at that little church. And I got down to that altar and I began to pray. And I said, Lord, I want you to fill me with the Holy Ghost. I want you to give me the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, I felt something wonderful and just this amazing sensation come over me. And it just flooded me. I, it's so hard to describe. It, it's like God wraps His arms around you. You know when somebody loves you and just gives you a loving hug, you know. I went a few years back, Tommy and I went to Connecticut to visit family and friends and I went to see a cousin of mine that's very special to me I hadn't seen her in a long long time and I was excited to see her and we found out her address and I went to her house and knocked on the door and she came to the door and it was so funny because she didn't even recognize me didn't even know who I was I said do you know who I am she said no I said, honey, it's Chuck. And she said, Chuck. And boy, this look come on her face. And boy, she threw her arms open and she wrapped herself around me and gave me the longest, the most enduring, the most loving hug I think I've ever had in my life. Remember that, Tommy? That's what the baptism of the Holy Ghost felt like to me. It was the most loving embrace. It was the most wonderful experience of my life. And all of a sudden, I found my little five-year-old self praying, but I was no longer praying in English. I didn't have to try. I didn't have to do nothing. I wasn't even involved in the process. I just found myself talking to the Lord and praying and blah, 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 and just speaking in another language as the Spirit of God gave me the utterance. And this is the evidence that one has received the gift of the Holy Ghost. That night, my mother hadn't gone to church that night. I think we were in revival. And my grandmother had taken me to church that night she brought me home and I'm telling you I'll never forget it as long as I live I remember the ride home to everything I looked at looked new to me everything all of a sudden the whole world was just cotton candy and marshmallows everything everything was just woo, I was just flying high everything looked different to me isn't that the most beautiful telephone pole you've ever looked at? I should go over and hug that telephone pole. I felt love for everything and everybody. Honey, the Word of God says God is love. When God fills you with His Spirit, guess what? One of the major side effects of being filled with the Spirit of God is you're going to feel love for everything you look at. You're going to be overwhelmed by and overcome by a sensation of love. All the gifts of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, otherwise known as patience, meekness, all these things you begin to feel all these things in abundance and it's just wonderful and then from that day forward it is about learning listen to me it's about learning to teach your external man to yield and let the internal man that now is full of the Holy Ghost dictate how you do things and how you approach things. The problem for a lot of believers is they get the Holy Ghost and the next morning they wake up and say, okay, Lord, now you sit back here and I'll take turns from here. 
But the Bible said as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We've got to learn to let the Spirit lead us. See, that's what the Lord came as a man to demonstrate for us. What it looks like when the Spirit of God within dictates what we do without. That's what Jesus was. He was one great big illustration. What does it look like when a human being is full of God's Spirit and allows the Spirit of God to dictate what they say and what they do and how they do it? how they approach things, how they respond to things. That's why the Lord said, I don't say anything of myself. He said, what the Father tells me to say, that's what I say. I don't do anything of what the Father tells me to do, that's what I do. Amen. He didn't mean another person sitting in heaven. He meant the Spirit within him. And that's what we then are commissioned to try to learn to do is to surrender to the will and the leadership of the Holy Ghost within. It takes work. It's not easy because we, we've lived our whole lives letting the flesh and letting the lust, the desires of the flesh dictate what we do and how we do it. Somebody does something malicious, we get angry, we want revenge, right? But see, when we allow the Spirit of God to dictate, I had a lady years ago who literally gave away everything I owned while I was away trying to organize a move, a relocation to another city. And she didn't like the idea that I was moving. She was a friend of mine, supposed to be a friend of mine. All of a sudden, she took everything I owned that was in storage at the church and sold it in a great big old yard sale. This lady had some serious psychological issues, and to be honest, I knew that even as I was friends with her. But I never dreamed she would do this. Somebody said to me, well, you need to take her to court. You need to sue her. And immediately I responded and I said, no, I can't do that. And I said, well, why can't you? I said, because the word of God said that brothers not to go to law against brother. Well, but she did you wrong. She did you dirty. That's all well and good. I understand that. But the word of God said, see, the spirit of God within you is going to encourage you to do things God's way. And let me tell you, not only does he encourage you to do it, but I'm going to tell you, he has a way of giving you peace and, and helping you to deal with things so that it wasn't easy for me to lose everything. I mean, everything I owned, folks. The only thing I had left was one suitcase full of clothes and a Bible and a concordance that I won as a 12-year-old kid in church, in a contest at church. That's all I had left. That's it. Every single thing I own, this lady sold. But I still had peace when I said, no, I, I can't go to court. I can't. Let me tell you something. Ask Tommy. Ask the moving company. We had to hire seven pods to move all our possessions from Dallas to Alabama. Uh, has God restored to me everything that I lost? Yeah, about five, six, seven times over. It's everything I owned at, at the time she sold it, you know, could easily have fit in this one area we're in right here. But you see, the Spirit within will help you to do the right thing if you'll let it. You still got to follow his lead. You still got to yield to his direction. He doesn't take over. He doesn't, you know, turn into a robot. No, not at all. But Paul said, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That ye put on the new man. In other words, do things a new way, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And how does he define the new man? How do, what, what does he say the new man looks like or acts like? He said, wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. 
He said, be angry, but don't sin. Don't respond in a way that's contrary to godliness. He said, don't, don't be angry and go to bed angry. Make sure you resolve issues before the day is done. Don't put it off. He said, don't give place to the devil. Don't give the devil any opportunity. Don't sit there and contemplate. Well, you know, I could get revenge. I could do, you know, I could do this. And boy, that would teach her a lesson. Or that would teach him a lesson. Blah, 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 blah. Or put yourself in a position where you know good and well there's going to be a temptation to do something y'all know to do. See, that's, that's a mistake a lot of Christians make. Then they say, Oh Lord, I screwed up. I messed up, Lord. I did something I shouldn't have done. Well, honey, if you had made the right choice from the get-go, that would have never happened. You knew better than to go there. You knew better than to do that. You knew better than to drink that or to smoke that or to inject that. Hello now. Don't give place to the devil. He said, the guy that runs around stealing, he said, stop stealing and work with your hands. He said, and work with your hands something good and positive and constructive so that you can give to those that have need. See the difference in motivation? See the difference in the way as a child of God you look at things? It's not about so you can have more and you can have more and you can have more. No, no, no. All of a sudden it becomes about I'm concerned that I want to be able to help people if they need help. He goes on to say, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying. He said everything comes out of your mouth ought to be able to comfort and build up and encourage. Edify. He said that it may minister grace to the hearers. I know somebody that's been struggling with alcohol addiction for quite a while now. And this person has said to me, thank you for loving me and accepting me and not judging me and criticizing me in my struggle. And I said, why in the world would I do that? Why in the world would I do that? My whole job as a believer, not as a pastor, as a believer, is to only speak words that minister grace. Hello now. To remind you that God's grace is sufficient for you. To remind you that where we are weak, He is strong. To remind you that where sin abounds, grace doth even more abound. That's my job. Everything supposed to come off my lips is supposed to be full of grace and ministering grace. Am I telling the truth? You see, these are things that ought to be the byproduct of the new mind. How many Christians do you know and they don't live like this. He said, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. What does that mean? Don't do the things you ought not to be doing. So every time, Christian, you run around barking condemnation and criticism and nastiness and malice at somebody because you don't agree with their lifestyle or you don't agree with something. You are grieving the Holy Ghost within you. The Spirit of God is grieved within you every time you act like a donkey. Every time you act contrary to the manner that God would have you to act. You are grieving the Holy Spirit. And Paul said, don't do that cracks me up we've got doctors who call themselves Christian doctors and, and the Republican Party is trying to give them the opportunity to refuse to treat LGBT people based on their religious convictions are you kidding me are you honestly kidding me any Christian doctor should be looking at the Republican Party and saying you people are out of your bloody stinking mind 
as the child of God, my Bible tells me that I'm to love my enemies, to pray for them which despitefully use me. My Bible tells me that I'm to do good unto all men. I don't need your permission to refuse to treat somebody because nowhere in the world would I ever, 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 ever want to not help somebody. I don't care what they live like. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what they do or who they do it with. That should be the response. But luckily, the majority of people in our world today who call themselves Christians have not been born again the Bible way and they do not have the Holy Ghost. Oh, they'll tell you they do. Oh, when I went down to the altar at First Baptist Church and prayed the sinner's prayer, they told me I received the Holy Ghost right then and there below me. That's a lie from the pit of hell. And I'm going to tell you something. Their doctrine and their teaching reflects the fact that that's a lie. Because the next breath they say, oh, do whatever feels good to you. Do it. If you feel like you want to refuse to help somebody, you, you can do that. You have God's permission to. The Bible doesn't say that, but they do. John chapter 13, 34 through 35, Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that she love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. In Galatians 6, 4 through 50, uh, 14 and 15, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. That which changes that conversion is not the outward man, but the inward man. The Holy Ghost breathes new life into our otherwise dead soul. Now with the Spirit of the Lord present in our lives, we are to think differently. Our actions may change, but they do not change because God has somehow forced us into compliance with His will, but rather because we now seek the world and we see circumstances which we must face differently than we did as an unbeliever. The Apostle Paul said again in Philippians 3, 8 through 15, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to count them but dumb, former things have passed away, that I may win Christ, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. He said, folks, I don't consider myself as having arrived at perfection. He said, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. 
Let us therefore as many as be perfect. And the word perfect here means mature, grown. Be thus minded. He said, if, if we're grown up spiritually, if we're grown up, he said, then let us all think like this. That we've not attained. That we're not there. That we haven't arrived. He said, and if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. So Paul said, if you have any thought process that is contrary to the way you ought to be thinking, said God will show you. The Lord will help you to see it. Why? Because we're supposed to have the spirit of our mind renewed. Am I telling the truth? Philippians 2, 3 through 8, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You remember when I said Jesus was a walking, living, breathing illustration of a man, a physical man, allowing the Spirit of God to dwell within and dictate how he did things and how he responded and how he reacted, what he said and what he did. Paul said, let this, man, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He said, you ought to have the same humility. You ought to have the same obedience. You ought to have the same submission. The same people who most often preach the new creature sermon and others are themselves the least new of any who identify as Christian. Those things which ought to be new are no different than they were before that individual believed the gospel. Their mindset is still carnal. Their thinking is still worldly. Their actions are still based upon the desires of their own heart and the lusts of their own flesh. They are full of hatred, malice, anger, angst, grievance, vitriol, and avarice or greed. The last thing they have any desire to do is to serve anyone. Yet the Word of God teaches us that the new man, after the example of Christ, is recreated in the spirit of servitude and humility. 1 John 4, 7-13 Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and His love is perfected in us. Talk about being a new creature. If you're the new creature that Paul told us about in our primary text today, 2 Corinthians 5.17, then, honey, the first sign, the first evidence 
of your being, a new creature in Christ, ought to be what? Love. Amen. Hereby know we that we dwell in Him. And He in us. Because He hath given us of His Spirit. The first sign of newness in the life of a new believer ought to be the capacity and the willingness to love. We ought not to be preoccupied with sitting in judgment of others, criticizing one another or condemning others. But rather we ought to be consumed with love. How can we possess within us the Spirit of God, whom the Word of God declares is love, and not be consumed with a capacity for love? Romans 14, 12 through 19. I know I'm going a little bit long and I apologize. So that every one of us should give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore. But judge this rather. That no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not terribly. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of man. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Born again believers experience a new birth within. It is that inward change that causes us then to become a new creation. The inward change produces outward evidence, but the evidences are not the change. They're the byproduct of the change which has occurred within us. We preach in this church that born again believers, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 17, are new creatures. Oh yes, we are a new creature indeed. Hallelujah. We are a new creation. We don't become something fictional, we don't become something supernatural, but we become something brand new, something that did not exist before the hand of God touched our life. Amen. We become a Jericho Duma. We become a racist people under God. The Spirit of God and the Spirit of man are joined together, and in that joining, a new creation is born. Hallelujah. Amen. A new creature indeed. Amen.